for accepting to to present uh, your work about uh, the COVID and the study of all the data on all this situation. Uh, first of all, uh, a brief introduction. Christelle Fess is professor of biostatistics uh, and he's in the Hassel University, but also in the Data Science Institute of in Hassel University. And she's working at the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. No? Uh, well, she has uh, working a lot about uh, statistics and biostatistics in particular, and during the, the years of the COVID and, and after that, <laughs> she has been working in the in the analysis and modelization of this type of data, and also working with the with the people in Belgium that has to take decision in the politic uh, no, level just to, to, to produce, well, the summaries and the decisions and doing supporting to, to all of them. And she's present, well, she, she agrees to, to present this talk in, during the conference in Madrid, the, the biometric conference. Unfortunately, it was not possible. And now we have, again, the opportunity <laughs> to listen to you. Thank you very much, Crystal. And, and we, we are here to, to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind invitation. And uh, the well, it, in, indeed, the, the previous talk did not work out due to COVID. <laughs> um, but uh, so I hope uh, everything uh, will work fine uh, today. Uh, so if everything goes well you should see uh, my screen now um and uh so indeed um i'm i'm working in, in the data science institute at hasselt university and uh, our institute has been uh, heavily involved in the um during the covid uh, pandemic uh to help policymakers to uh, make uh, decisions on uh, restrictions on on yeah all the uh, questions they actually had and uh, so it was a very exciting period uh, uh, and yeah what I would like today uh, to 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 talk about uh, today is uh, like yeah several of these aspects uh, of course uh, there were so many questions and we did so many analyses that I had to uh, choose some of the topics um, so what I wanted to uh, or what I would like to show here today is that um, yeah, different statistical methods have been very, very useful during the pandemic. Um, but it's also not the case that one model can serve uh, for any purpose. And even depending on the time in the pandemic, it were other types of models that were or had to be used. So I would like to show uh, some growth models uh, in both the early and the later phase of the pandemic. Uh, what also uh, we found very important was um, in order to uh, explain to politicians, for example, what is going on, uh, we had to make several visual displays. And um, one of the visual displays that we made was a cliquet diagram. Uh, so also that is something that I would like uh, to uh, show here. It's it's not like a very advanced statistical technique, um, but a way to try to explain to politicians and policymakers uh, what is the current situation. And then, of course, during yeah, a pandemic, uh, we also noticed that sometimes certain uh, techniques uh, were not um or should be improved and uh that's also what we have been uh, working on um so and one of the uh, me methodologies that we looked at was uh an estimation of a time varying uh, reproduction number um so uh starting with um yeah the the pandemic in belgium um belgium yeah was actually quite severely hit uh, by the uh, coronavirus. Um, in, in Belgium, there is a, the pop we have a population of about 11 million. And uh, in August 21, uh, we had already more than a million confirmed uh, cases. So it's, it's one in 11 uh, uh, of the individuals that did get a confirmed uh, COVID-19 um, uh, test. Uh, 
A year later, in May 22, uh, it were already 4 million confirmed uh, cases uh, in uh, Belgium. And um, OK, uh, getting COVID, it's, it's not nice. Uh, but uh, of course, we also know that uh, many people did really get very ill, uh, severely ill, get, did get hospitalized. And there was also a, a high mortality also in Belgium. So in Belgium, uh, after the first year in August 21, there were uh, almost, uh, yeah, there were more than 25,000 uh, deaths uh, and 31,000 uh, a year later in May uh, 22. Um, why is uh, Belgium, yeah, seriously hit uh, by COVID? Uh, we think that it is also due to um, the high connectivity with other countries. It's it's a high. Uh, there's a lot of international mobility in Belgium. Uh, Belgium being also located in the center of the U of Europe, many people traveling via Belgium to other countries. Um, we have also, or we are a country uh, with a very high population density, um, as you uh, might be aware. We have a quite high average household size and. Um, the, the age structure is also um, more uh, towards an older population structure. Um, this mixed with a uh, high mixing behavior between the younger, uh, younger people, like the children, with the uh, elderly uh, population. Uh, so all of that can explain why yeah, in Belgium yeah, there, were, there was actually quite high uh, mortality uh, rates uh, of COVID-19. Um, and as I've mentioned, like um, during the pandemic, um, we were uh, from the very start uh, involved as a data science institute uh, in giving advice uh, to uh, policymakers uh, on the uh, uh, on, on the pandemic, and and we get did get yeah during the pandemic a huge amount of questions. Uh, many of the questions were related to prediction, especially in the beginning. Uh, everyone wanted to know what will be going on, uh, what can we expect? Uh, and uh, in terms of prediction, it was mainly related to, especially in the beginning, to how many hospitalizations uh, do we expect in the short and in the long run? Because, of course, um, yeah, we know that hospitals had to pre be prepared for a huge amount of hospitalizations uh, and, and um, yeah, it was important to predict like, yeah, the, the hospital care that was needed, uh, also intensive care that was needed, um, how many, um, uh, uh, later on, uh, like how many vaccines had to be uh, 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 um, uh, but, uh, but also, uh, yeah, in terms of medication, how ma many uh, medication had to be uh, bought, etc. So a lot of questions related to prediction, also not only related to hospitalization, but also how many uh, people will be ex absent at work in certain sectors. Uh, other questions uh, were related to, uh, yeah, what are good measures to reduce the spread? Uh, so what would be the impact of restriction me measures on reducing the spread? Which uh, restriction measures should be used? Um, we, we had, of course, also a lockdown. How do you go out of that lockdown? Uh, but then later with, with, with the vaccination, yeah, who do you start vaccinating? What is the best technique? What is the best strategy? Uh, to um, have the, the yeah to lower uh, the impact of the uh, pandemic. Um, some might uh, know that I'm I'm also uh, working uh, quite a lot in uh, spatial statistics. Uh, so uh, we also uh, worked on uh, geographical outbreak detection uh, methods uh, for COVID. Uh, so also uh, these were used by the. Uh, governments, uh, so, so that they, they could locally look at yeah, which municipalities, which areas were impacted more, so that they could take action as well, very locally in uh, particular areas. Many other questions that we investigated during the pandemic and, and also after that <laughs> are related to really understanding the uh, dynamics of COVID-19. Uh, it's, it's, it was like a new uh, uh virus that came in uh, we did not know a lot uh, or we did not know anything in the beginning uh, about um uh covid-19 uh, 
Um, so uh, things like, yeah, what is the reproduction number? Uh, what is the impact of super spreading events? Uh, what is the time between infection and symptom onset? Uh, what will be the length of stay in hospital, the infection mortality rate? All these kind of aspects um, were uh, looked at uh, during uh, the pandemic. Um, and uh, in our research group, uh, we worked uh, both uh, on mechanistic models, like the mathematical, compartmental models, uh, and on the other hand, the statistical models. And we have used them uh, both uh, together also, uh, because we think that yeah, the statistical models, models are also very important to inform the uh, mathematical models, uh, taking into account also uncertainty in these models, etc. So here in this talk, I would like to focus on the statistical models um, and uh, starting with uh, the very beginning uh, of the, uh, the, the pandemic, um, where first cases came in in Belgium and uh, yeah, what do we expect? What, what, how can we then describe the epidemic evolution in, in that very first early phase? Um, and it was really about estimating the growth. Yeah, so growth models uh, for it's the first uh, uh, situation hospitalizations because hospitalization in in the um, first uh, wave of the pandemic were most important. And uh, related to that was okay. How many hospital beds do we need in Belgium? How many beds do we need in ICU? And what's the chance? What's how likely is it that uh, the uh, number of beds uh, exceeds certain thresholds? In the beginning, uh, it was asked like, yeah, what what's the chance that we need more than five hundred hospital beds or thousand hospital beds? Uh, later, it was five thousand hosp hospital beds. Uh, so all of that were questions we did get just to prepare the country for what was uh, coming. And in the very fir first phase, yeah, of course, you, you only have very few data. Uh, so what then do you do? Well, we used phenomenological models, which we fitted in a Bayesian paradigm. Um, so basically, starting point is we model number of new hospitalizations. These are like counts per day. Uh, and we use a negative binomial model because of the high variation in the data. And in the very first days or the, the, after the very first day, the only thing you see is there is some increase. Yeah, so at, at the very first beginning of the uh, pandemic, we used an exponential growth model to think about, okay, what can go on or what is going on? Of course, we know that it's, it's, it starts with an exponential growth, but then after some time, it kind of levels up, levels up, there comes a kind of st stabilization. And for this, we use the logistic uh, growth model. After that, we see like a peak and there starts to get a decrease, a turning, there is a turning point. Uh, and this can be modeled using a logistic uh, distribution model. Once you are like in the descending phase, yeah, what typically is seen is that yeah, the uh, speeds in which you go up is different from the speed in which you go down. Um, and that's why yeah, from the logistic uh, distribution model, we moved also to the Richards model, which allow this asymmetric uh, curvature. Yeah? So basically, these are some nonlinear regression models that we fit to hospitalization data, but at different phases in the um, uh, epidemic. And, and, and the, in the very beginning, like, yeah, after a week, it's not feasible yet to fit like a Richards model because you only have information about that growth. Yeah, so it, it, you always have to think about at what phase can you use what particular model. Based on this, that's can that this this model can then be used to predict like the number of new hospitalizations. But for us, interest was also in the prediction of of hospital loads. Yeah, so that also means taking into account how, how long patients did stay in hospital. And honestly, we did not know. Yeah, if we ask like uh, uh, specialists uh, in the hospital, he said, well, I have no idea how long patients stay in hospital. Yeah, there, there were also only few patients at the start of the pandemic, of course, and treatment was changing, etc. 
So what we did, uh, the kind of information we had like, was like the number of new hospitalizations per day. And we knew how many patients are in hospital on a certain day. We did not know like uh, which patient came in hospital and went out of hospital. So we did not really have information about the length of stay of each patient. Yeah. So that's why next to the model for new hospitalizations, we decided to also model the hospital loads, so the, the, the count of hospital loads, again with a negative binomial model, with a mean structure. And the mean structure we modeled in this way. Yeah. So the mu i is actually linked to the, the, the model on the previous page, so a, fit, uh, a model for the hospitalizations. But hospital load is linked to that by taking into account the probability that the patient on day K after hospitalization is still in hospital or in ICU. Yeah? This length of stay, we did not know. Yeah? And therefore, here in this phase, we just assumed that yeah, it follows some kind of distribution, a gamma, a y bull, a log normal distribution. Yeah? So this model, so the model for new hospitalization and hospital load, it was then uh, jointly fitted in a Bayesian framework um, to get both an estimation of hospital, hospitalization and hospital load, and actually also for uh, the, hosp uh, the, the ICU load. And because we worked with the Bayesian framework, for policymakers, it was very easy to translate this in threshold probability. So what is the probability that the number of patients in hospital would exceed a certain number? Uh, so this information was actually used uh, and, and provided to the policymakers. And, and this is just a screenshot of some days in the very beginning of the pandemic. Uh, so uh, April 6, April 10, April 14, etc. So in the very first wave of, of the pandemic. And you see, this is the kind of data we had in black. In red, it was the data that we are predicting and uh, that we were trying to predict uh, for um, based on our model. And as you can see, we often had like two models. Yeah? So the different colors correspond to the different models um, using the different uh, epidemic uh, moments uh, or the different epidemic models at the different phases. So like the exponential, um, the uh, logistic, etc. These two models, we so every day when we made a prediction, we always tested like, okay, which two models are actually the best models. And um, uh, based on that, we were always able to provide a kind of uh, best and a worst case scenario uh, for uh, our uh, predictions. So in that that way, so what we did was like by successively using the models, uh, we really went from uh, uh, yeah through the different models from one phase uh, to uh, another phase uh, using, uh, for example, the uh, Wakai case information uh, criteria. And I think here, yeah, this illustration of, of uh, a very simple model, it's, it's a nonlinear model, uh, by fitting it in a Bayesian framework, we were able to provide uh, in a very nice way feedback to the policymakers. So that's actually what I wanted to illustrate here. In a later phase of the pandemic, and now I, I, I Think about like uh, the later phase of the first wave, but also second wave until actually today. Um, we, we still have the question like, um, what do we expect in the coming weeks? Yeah, and, and here I think about like the next two weeks. So can we predict what is coming uh, uh, to us? And the question actually was, are there any early warning indicators that can help to predict what will be happening in hospitals. Yeah, so can we kind of make a short-term prediction model based on uh, early warning indicators? And, and for this, we uh, developed a uh, non-linear distributed lag model uh, working with different early warning predictors. Yeah, so we were yeah, working together with the, scientific, uh, the public health institute here 
Uh, and they were able to provide us with quite a lot of indicators that could help in uh, making uh, uh, good predictions for hospitalizations. Yeah, like, for example, um, we had like the positivity ratio of tests, COVID tests, uh, the amount of uh, people that were absent at work, uh, the number of people that did go to a general practitioner with respiratory symptoms. Uh, also, mobility from mobile phone network uh, was uh, provided on a daily basis. Uh, the restriction measures, of course, uh, the age of cases or the average age of cases and how that changed over time, the different variants, vaccination. Other predictors were tested as well, but those were the or these were the uh, most uh, important one. Uh, uh, telling us uh, something about hospitalization. And indeed, so what we found was a kind of hierarchy in uh, the uh, predictors. So what we found is that the positivity ratio of tests was an early warning predictor for the number of new hospitalizations with a delay of four to seven days with respect to hospitalization. Mobility also had like a almost direct effect on hospitalization. Uh, also, average age uh, was important, the variants, of course, and vaccination. Yeah. We also found because yeah, positivity ratio of tests, okay, it's an early warning indicator four to seven days before. Yeah, but there's also kind of delay in this information. So we looked also for another variable that could predict better the positivity ratio up front. And we found that absenteeism at work and also the number of people going to the general practitioner was a predictor 10 days ahead for the positivity ratio. And in this way, we were able to predict very well uh, 10 to 14 days ahead uh, what would be the number of hospitalization in um, uh, yeah, the number of hospitalizations. Um, also, mobility for or for mobility. Yet yeah, the restriction measures taken was a predictor for yeah the kind of mobility that uh, would go on in the next uh, fourteen uh, days because there was also kind of delay. So here, what we uh, worked on was a model uh, for the number of new hospitalizations, which we fitted at the province level in Belgium. So we did uh, not do that just at a at national level because we we thought, yeah, the, the more we refine, yeah, the more or the more information we get uh, to uh, make good predictions. Yeah, so that's why we worked at the province level. Um, and like I said, yeah, we used this kind of um, distributed lag nonlinear model. So saying that uh, the early warning predictors have an effect the, yeah, some, some days later uh, on the number of new hospitalizations and different transformations and different relationships were investigated for this. Here is just an illustration of uh, how it was used. Um, so here, this was based on data on uh, the very first wave. Uh, we then had like a very small increase during summertime. And then here on 1st of October, I did make this prediction. Um, so I only used the, the data in purple, like the number of new hospitalizations going on, plus, of course, the, er uh, the um, early warning indicators. And my prediction was here given in um, in, in gray, like uh, uh, the, the prediction with the prediction band. After 14 days, yeah, these red dots, uh, the number of new hospitalizations were observed. So you see that this kind of prediction was very well to predict also yeah, the, the start of the new uh, or the, the second large wave uh, in uh, Belgium. So this model has been used yeah, until today, um, we're using it, uh, we're providing it uh, on a, on, on, now on a weekly day uh, basis uh, during the pandemic on a, on a daily basis uh, to give input on what will be uh, going on. We did not only look at number of new hospitalizations, but also hospital load and ICU loads uh, was uh, 
uh, estimated from this. So this is a visualization of that. Uh, so it's an estimation of the number of ICU beds needed at a certain uh, moment in time, um, where again, the blue dots were the, the data and the red ones um, were not yet observed. So we did make a prediction uh, for that uh, period in time. So we predicted two uh, weeks ahead. And the, yeah, it, it, it are small things, but the way we visualized this was also with these um, green, yellow, red lines, because these were phases um, in which the hospital had to scale up. Yeah, so once they uh, would cross like 25% of the ICU beds, hospitals had to take action. Yeah, so this this boundary uh, boundary uh, uh, points were actually very important for policy makers, and that's why we included it also just graphically uh, to uh, uh, yeah mention like okay you have to take action now uh, or not yet maybe yeah you can uh, lose restrictions. And this was not only done at the national level, as I had mentioned, but also regional. Uh, this is for Brussels, Flanders and Walloon region, uh, and also at province level. Uh, the same kind of models were also uh, asked uh, by different hospitals, like uh, because uh, at the hospital level, also they wanted to make predictions uh, and similar kind of uh, tools were then uh, provided for these hospitals. Uh, so. In conclusion, there were uh, some nice set of early warning predictors uh, for number of new hospitalizations. Uh, so that's uh, that was positive. So based on that, we could uh, predict very well what was going on. On the other hand, yeah, due to constant change um, of the situation of the pandemic, like at some point there was the vaccination, at another point there was a new variant. All of that, of course, also changes your prediction. Yeah, so it means that also uh, regular updates were needed on the model uh, to yeah, take into account that new situation. Yeah, so, so that is something that uh, took quite a lot of time um, during the pandemic. Uh, it's not like just one model that yeah, we uh, developed in the beginning and, and uh, that, that, was, uh, that, that we were able to use all the time. It was really learning constantly um, uh, in case there was like a new setting, a new situation. The third topic I would like uh, to uh, show is uh, the visualization uh, that we used uh, with the clique diagram. Um, and, and the reason was uh, that we often did get a question like, yeah, when should we take restrictions? Uh, when uh, can we loosen restrictions? And um, during these discussions, um, we, we uh, heard that what they wanted is like a very simple kind of clique system, like uh, from this point onwards, yeah, you have to restrict. And from this point onwards, you have to loosen. Yeah. And of course, it's it's not yeah black and white, this kind of uh, system, but we tried to make a visualization uh, to, yeah, again, inform policymakers um, to indicate like how bad is the current situation or how good is the current situation. And all of that was, again, based on uh, hospitalizations and hospital loads. Uh, because that was primarily uh, the concern that hospitals were not able to cope with the amount of patients. Um, so what we made was a kind of face portrait to monitor the epidemic uh, and to assess whether certain intervention measures were either needed uh, to keep hospital capacity under control or could be loosened. Yeah? Uh, like I said, it was based on hospitalizations um, and in the cliquet diagram, uh, let me uh, just uh, show it first. Uh, the cliquet diagram, what we actually just present is the number of new hospitalizations versus the new hospitalizations or the growth in the number of new hospitalizations. That's it. Yeah, so it's actually very simple. New hospitalization versus the growth at a particular time in these new hospitalizations. Yeah, this growth is then based on the past 14 days. Uh, it's like the growth rate based on the uh, past 14 days of new hospitalizations. 
uh, which uh, was actually used in this uh, graph. Now, what you can see, of course, this will lead to these dots. Yeah. And uh, by the way, this is the very beginning of the um, first uh, wave uh, uh, where we had data here uh, for 1st of April. Uh, and uh, you see it's, it's um, yeah, the number of hospitals new hospitalizations is high, but also the growth is uh, very large at that time. So at that moment in time, the situation is actually very bad. Yeah. And then the lockdown starts um, and uh, gradually first, yeah, the growth is going down. And then, of course, with that also the number of new hospitalizations goes down. And, and this is the situation um, uh, during the lockdown first. So here uh, uh, where we have this decline. And then uh, at the point over here, uh, yeah, decisions are made to loosen restrictions. Yeah? And, and then this graph was used to see, well, are we again going up in terms of uh, growth? Yeah, so, so um, if we go up, then the number of new hospitalization will increase again. Yeah, so we had to stay low in terms of growth, so that gradually we were going to a situation where the number of new hospitalization was getting lower and lower and lower. Um, so on this graph, you see also the colors and the colors uh, are actually based on predicted ICU capacity. So what we did was for every pair in that, uh, uh, in, in that diagram, so for every pair of new hospitalizations and growth of hospitalization, we made a kind of prediction for what does this imply for the ICU capacity. And based on this, based on uh, the ICU capacity, we did give it a color. Yeah, green means we keep lower than 50% of the ICU beds. Um, and then yeah, yellow uh, was uh, the uh, region until a very first, yeah, what we call the phase 1A, uh, and at uh, when we crossed phase 1A, it means the hospital had to make beds free for COVID patients. Yeah, so um, the darker we did get, yeah, the more strict the restrictions were for hospitals and they had to yeah, free uh, beds. Uh, they could not uh, continue with other uh, health care, etc. So in this way, by, by combining this kind of information, like a prediction on um, uh, hospital load on the one hand side and a very simple graphical display of what is going on. Yeah, the, yeah this graph was used quite a lot during the pandemic to just really check like, okay, what are the restriction measures doing and at what time do we need a restriction measure? Yeah, and of course you always make like this circular move. Yeah, while you go over the different waves. Yeah, this is an example of wave two, the, the, the big wave in 2020, where this is the summer of 2020. So we started here and then the situation started to get worse. So the, the, there was a, a growth in hospitalizations. Um, and it's actually at this point in time that uh, we said, OK, now you have to be careful. Now you have to restri uh, restrict um, uh, or make restrictions, be careful about it. So for a week, it was OK. Uh, but then they said, ah, oh, now we're, we we stop all the restrictions. And what happened was, yeah, of course, we start, yeah, th there, there was an increase again of the number of uh, hospitalizations. And then it yeah, took quite long again until yeah, this uh, phase over here that they started to implement new uh, restriction measures. And then, yeah, of course, the situation uh, improved again. But yeah. I think also policy makers started uh, learning how to interpret this kind of graph. It was presented like on a weekly basis in a report for them. Um, and after some time they knew, okay, it's going up. Okay, we have to take care. It go, goes down. Okay, now we can loosen again. Um, and uh, so, so this, this is uh, yeah, an example of just a visualization of uh, what was um, uh, yeah, what was going on actually uh, in terms of hospitalization and ICU load? Um, 
Finally, what I still would wanted uh, to uh, show is a kind of methodological um, uh, development we made uh, for estimation of the reproduction number. And uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, you all have heard about the reproduction number uh, by now. Uh, so the reproduction number is the uh, can be defined as the average number of secondary cases generated by an infected case. And it's an important measure to monitor the infectiousness uh, of the disease, the transmissibility of the uh, disease uh, during the outbreak, where we want that RT to be below one, because if RT is below one, it means yeah, the epidemic uh, will um, um, yeah, actually reduce or the, the, the strength of the epidemic uh, is, is uh, getting down. Uh, so that's why yeah, also measures are taken, effect, uh, control measures, prevention measures are taken to lower that um, uh, RT. So it's also a way to determine whether or not these measures are effective or not. And there are different ways to make an estimation of the reproduction number, both mathematical approaches and statistical approaches. And here we use a statistical approach um, based on case notification data. Uh, and, and this is related to the approach proposed by White et al., uh, uh, who uh, came up with a framework uh, to uh, explain how reproduction number can be used uh, from case notification data, so number of cases per day, um, where the serial uh, or the generation interval is used uh, together with uh, this case not notification data. And uh, Corey et al. Have, have developed the EPS team package, which has been enormously used during the pandemic. It was a very important tool during the uh, pandemic to yeah, as a very simple technique to estimate the reproduction number. What we wanted to do is um, uh, provide a tool, also an estimation of the reproduction number, which was a bit more stable as, as EPS team. Uh, for those who have used EPS team, uh, you might know that EPS team is changing quite a lot uh, over time. And uh, if you use a spline-based approach, on the other hand, it is a bit more smooth, yeah. So that's that's the kind of idea that we wanted to use, which was also used in EpiNow, for example, um, and um, yeah, on which we further wanted to develop. Yeah. Again, we wanted to come up with a Bayesian approach, um, which we then called later EpiLPS, um, because in if if we work with the Bayesian approach, it's also easier to uh, quantify the uncertainty on the rep reproduction number. So the EPLPS approach, um, uh, you can find uh, all recent information on this website, EPLPS.com. Um, but basically, so uh, the starting point was uh, we want an estimation of reproduction number based on case notification data. Um, it is based on an epidemic renewal equation, which uh, I will show later. And um, we want to do a fast estimation. And the fast estimation was obtained by um, uh, making use of a Laplace approximation, which is a sampling free approach, um, and in combination with P splines. So uh, th that's why we say it's the Laplacian P spline smoothing uh, that we use here. We also um, developed an MCMC approach with Langevin diffusion, um, which is also related uh, to uh, the LPS map approach. Yeah, for those actually wanting to do uh, this, uh, yeah, MCMC approach instead of Laplace approximation. So what is the kind of model? Well, we have a model for the number YT, the number of cases, reported on a certain day. So uh, it's it's the date of, we assume it's date of symptom onset. Uh, so that's the number of new infections. Uh, we model it uh, with a negative binomial model and the mean of that negative binomial function is modeled in a smooth way over time. Yeah. So over time, what we do is we model it with a B spline. Uh, so we have here uh, the log of mu t, which is related to the B spline basis with these parameters theta, the parameters to be estimated uh, in that model. Now, 
because we want to penalize also the parameters, uh, we use a p-spline, uh, or we put p-splines in the Bayesian framework again by using different penalties on these uh, parameters. Um, so this is translated in this uh, Gaussian uh, prior uh, uh, to smooth the uh, parameters. And then, of course, we also have the hyper priors on which uh, we uh, uh, specify some uh, or the hyper parameters on which we specify hyper priors. So uh, that is the model. Then, of course, estimation can be done in, for example, MCMC. And we have done that in the past, but that takes long. And that's why we wanted to come up with a fast approach, uh, and we uh, developed this Laplace approximation, uh, which basically uh, starts from uh, 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 the conditional posterior of the parameters, given the uh, nuisance parameters, and uh, uh, approximating this by a uh, uh, Gaussian uh, distribution um, uh, from a newton refson uh, algorithm. Yeah. Uh, next to this Laplace approximation, as uh, I uh, mentioned, we used also an uh, MCMC approach. Um, but from these estimates, so what we did was, um, so from, the, from this model, we get again a model for new hospitalizations or, or new cases, sorry. Uh, and then we use the uh, mean estimates as a plug-in in the renewal equation. So the renewal equation is given over here. So that's a way to estimate a reproduction number uh, at time t, at time 2, until k, where k is uh, the length of the serial interval. Uh, so here this phi, it's the serial interval distribution. And we just plug in the mean of the function uh, here in this uh, equation. Credible intervals for this reproduction number can be obtained uh, using a delta method approach uh, on the uh, log of the reproduction uh, number. And some scaling was also done on the covariance matrix uh, to uh, get a better uh, accuracy of the uh, credible interval uh, coverages. So next, to, like I just mentioned already, also this MCMC approach was uh, developed uh, in, in a modified metropolis adjusted Langevin algorithm. Uh, and all of these are available in this EPLPS uh, package uh, at the moment. Uh, so um, where the, the user can choose um, whether he wants Laplace approximation or this um, uh, MALA approach. The advantage of MALA is that uh, the uncertainty around the penalty uh, and the over dispersion is accounted for, whereas that is not the case in the uh, Laplace approximation. Um, now, simulations show that the two are very, very similar. Uh, the advantage of using Laplace is that it's really, really fast. Um, so we did also some simulations to test the performance of these techniques. Uh, so we uh, basically simulated epidemic data uh, uh, from also a uh, given reproduction number. So based on that, we use the renewal equation to get uh, like an epidemic curve. Uh, we also um, uh, took into account over dispersion. And then we made the comparison with the EPS team package to see how uh, uh, the model uh, was uh, com or methods were comparing. Yeah, so this is the kind of simulated incidence uh, data. Uh, this is the assumed in black uh, the uh, the true reproduction number. So where we assume that a certain measure is taken, and because of that there is a rapid decline. And then in blue here is the um, estimated uh, approach by EPLPS, so the smooth curve that we assume. The red one is the uh, epi -esteem, uh, uh, from the epi -esteem, uh, package. Um, so, yeah, what you can see is that, and, and here, by the way, in green, it's also the epi -esteem, uh, package uh, with the uncertainty included. So, so what you can see is that the epi -LPS is doing actually a very good job uh, to uh, get a good estimate of the reproduction number, whereas EPS team had like a delay in uh, getting the right uh, values there. Yeah, we looked at other scenarios uh, where we uh, noticed okay, also this is working well, 
um, and also a scenario like this, uh, where again, yeah, you see here in blue the EPLPS approach, which closely follows uh, the, um, the the target uh, reproduction number, whereas EPS-STIM has a kind of delay um, in uh, the uh, estimation of the reproduction number. In terms of computational speed, this goes uh, very fast, less than a second. Uh, so uh, even for very long uh, time series uh, in which we're working now, yeah, because we have yeah, data for, for years now, uh, even in this case, this technique still is uh, very fast. And, and this is an illustration also. Um, it, it's also an analysis that, that is available on the EPI uh, LPS uh, website. Uh, so an estimation of the reproduction number uh, from uh, yeah, over somewhat more than a year uh, for Belgium, Denmark, Portugal and France. And I should have included Spain, but uh, sorry that I did not do that. Um, but yeah, what you can see is that the, the, the curve in color, that's the EPLPS uh, curve. Whereas the EPS stim curve, you see it on top of that. Uh, maybe I should make it bigger. So here you see also um, an, a more wiggly curve, uh, which is the estimated reproduction number from EPS stim. Yeah, so that's what I, I actually mean by yeah, the EPS stim is less um, stable or it's 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 more variable. Uh, it's it's very fast changes um, uh, through uh, the epidemic. Um, so, um, yeah, that, that is uh, what has been uh, discussed by, uh, uh, in the paper by, by Chris Sani et al., which is at this moment uh, published already. Uh, at this moment, uh, we are also um, uh, adding now casting. So, uh, what is the impact of uh, delay of reporting on estimation of the um, reproduction number? And of course, at the end, uh, it is uh, impacting the reproduction uh, and can uh, uh, have a serious impact. Uh, so it is important to take that into account as well. So we're in the process of um, uh, adding that to the package uh, EPLPS so that now costing can also be integrated. That's all I wanted to mention today. Uh, there are so many things uh, I could still talk about, uh, but yeah, what I wanted to mention and, and maybe conclude with is that um, yeah, the pandemic had, has been like on the one hand an awful um, uh, period uh, for many of us uh, from health perspective. It has been a very difficult period, but for scientific uh, reasons and uh, also I think for the biostatistics community, uh, it's yeah, it has been a very nice period uh, because it uh, gave us so much opportunities to think about models, methods, and also to help uh, policymakers uh, to uh, and, and show the importance actually of biostatistics uh, in the uh, community. So thanks a lot. Um, let me know if you have any interest in any of these papers, I would be happy to share. I would like also to thank all the co-authors and the whole group um, uh, with uh, who we have worked on this uh, topic. So I would be happy to take any questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Christel. Um, uh, if you have any questions, Klaus has raised his hand. And if you have... Uh... I was a mistake. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> I think I take, I take advantage to, to thanks a lot, Kristen, for the very nice talk. Thank you. Um, someone has some questions or comments? Hi. Annabelle, okay. <laughs> Hi. So, very nice talk, Kristen. I really enjoy it. And I have. I don't know because at the beginning I couldn't stay from the beginning because I have a doctor appointment. I'm really sorry. So I maybe you said something and I miss it. But I, I have two questions. One is about the data definition. So you did a really great job, and you said that you did it in several hospitals and even in several regions. Did you encounter many difficulties to have a common definition of the variables and that kind of things? Oh, um, 
Yes, uh, we, we did encounter quite a lot of problems in any possible way with data. <laughs> um, and um, well, we work with different hospitals, uh, but yeah, the advantage was that, well, there were, it's, it's not that there were big differences between definitions amongst hospitals, but rather uh, because it was the scientific uh, institute that also uh, asked for the data. So because of that, they defined the data, all of them in more or less the same way. But definition changed over time. Uh, because, for example, in, in the very beginning, um, we did get like um, reported like the number of new hospitalizations of COVID patients. But what are COVID patients? Um, and uh, also sometimes we heard from, from people working in the hospital that sometimes it were people hospitalized with, I don't know what, <laughs> but not for COVID, but they had COVID symptoms or they tested positive for COVID. And because of that, yeah, they also uh, had to, yeah, be, let's say, taken care of in a different way as other patients. Um, and yeah, at that point in time, we asked for, yeah, splitting this data because, yeah, we, we had to know like how many patients are hospitalized for COVID and how many patients are hospitalized with COVID. And yeah, so this kind of, um, yeah, changes in the data came in through time. And we always, yeah, at that point in time, were a bit like, ah, how is it possible that they <laughs> uh, have, yeah, have not mentioned that before, but yeah, that I, I think it, it happened in, in yeah, many places. And um, yeah, that, that was also because we were not prepared for that. Um, uh, another aspect, uh, which is related to definition, that is, uh, yeah, how, who dies from COVID, yeah, so um, mort mortality and the definition of mort yeah, COVID mortality. And uh, I remember uh, very early in the pandemic, there was actually a newsletter in the uh, US uh, stating um, that uh, the former president <laughs> stated that uh, Belgium, it was the worst place on earth to live. Uh, because the mortality rate in Belgium was the hugest ever. Um, but of course, yeah, we also thought, oh, what is going on? Why is this the case? Um, basically, yeah, Belgium reported a lot of, yeah, mortality cases, much more, I think, than other countries. And um, to make a comparison, uh, what we did was we, we also looked at uh, excess mortality. So how many more deaths are there as compared to in other years? And what we found is that the excess mortality matched very well with the mortal reported mortality in Belgium. So, so I think that we, we, we did actually a very good job <laughs> in reporting the uh, that was what was really what I was rate. thinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because here it was the other way around. Yes, so yeah. we report as much and then we have a really excess of mortality. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, indeed. indeed. Oh. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think it's indeed related. Sorry? No, no, no. That I think most most of us had the same problems with data. Yeah. But it's still that the, the definition matters a lot and yeah. mainly in that one. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Thank you very much, Christian. You're welcome. welcome. Thank you. Okay, if some more questions. I don't know if Lupe has said something or no. <laughs> and uh, one question for me. <laughs> In in your data, when it was the rise and down, it was for the reported data, I suppose, no? Because yeah, of yeah. a daily week, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. It, and another question, what uh, software that, that have you used or your team have used to feed all, all this stuff? Uh, 
Um, yeah, most of this was done uh, using R. Mm -hmm. um, so the yeah, I think for all the statistical models uh, we do, did use R. Uh, we also uh, did some uh, yeah mathematical modeling, uh, mathematical modeling yeah to like really predict for the next months. Uh, so uh, like uh, do scenario analysis, and there we yeah also worked with yeah uh, MATLAB with C plus plus. So so but that that was for the mathematical models. Yeah. And the Bayesian models, they, they were fit with INLA or with your um, um, Yeah, well, or no, no. Mix? <laughs> well, most of these models were fitted with Nimble. Ah, Nimble, okay. Um, but also INLA models uh, were fitted, um, yeah, and, and, and for like the, the Laplace approximations, uh, it was, yeah, all yeah, derived ourselves. So, so we did the analytical derivations uh, and yeah, then, then it's a matter of programming or together with uh, C also uh, to get these very fast estimations. Mm -hmm. oh, a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that, yeah. there's a lot of work. Uh, we I had think a very it... good team uh, to do yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> it was really a team effort, yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> no, no, because you know, with the cell phone, it's very complicated, and and I tried to to just hand my my you know raise my hand, and I couldn't find where to raise my hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, so thank you, Crystal. It was a really nice talk, and and I mean, I envy you in the in the good sense because it, you know, as you very well said, I mean, it was a a very I mean, awful situation because we neither one wanted to have this COVID, but from the biostatistical community, it was illegal. I mean, uh, because I think that uh, in general, we are much more appreciated now than before. Uh, and also because I think, you know, that this collaboration, like the team that you had and, you know, in a much more modest thing, a team that we put together also here in Catalonia, this wouldn't have happened before, you know, this, because it's when you have this, you know, purpose that that's the important thing and it goes, you know, first, you know, and before every other thing, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that uh, we have learned a lot from, from this awful situation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have one question. Uh, I think that we already mentioned that, I'm not sure. Uh, you mentioned that for the reproduction number, you need to to compute or to estimate the infection time. So this difference since the person is infected, since they develop symptoms. And I didn't get how you do that, or, or is just you parametrizing this model, or how, how do you do that? Yeah, so in uh, in some of the models, we just parametrize it. And uh, so, so the model for the... Um, New hospitalization and hospital loads. Uh, we parameterize the length of stay, um, and uh, yeah, in in that way, try to feed it as a latent process. Um, but in other methods, uh, we did make use of an estimate of, uh, for example, the serial interval, the generation interval, uh, all these kind of yeah. Uh, distributions, length of stay, for example, in hospital later on uh, was also uh, looked at. Um, and, and for that, yeah, we in, actually in the very beginning of the pandemic, um, we did get information from the very first patients uh, in Wuhan. Um, so we, we did have a co collaboration um, with uh, RIVM in the Netherlands uh, who knew a Chinese person who was able to translate all the case reports from the very beginning. And we used those to estimate like the uh, generation interval. Yeah, so that okay. we did that like it, it was in, in February, really the beginning of February uh, uh, 2020. So, so before even yeah, the, 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 the pandemic was 
yeah, it, it was really a pandemic and, and uh, before the, the first cases were there in Belgium. So this has been, yeah, uh, a very important work for us and, and also for yeah. others uh, to, yeah, to, to get an idea of this generation interval. Um, yeah. yeah, what you call generation interval, is this the same that the incubation time? No, so, no, 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 it's something else. No. Yeah. So okay. the incubation time, it's the time indeed between, um, yeah, first Infection getting symptoms and, symptoms. and then, yeah. That's the yeah. one I have been, yeah. That's yeah. The one I have been working and, you know, yeah. it's quite difficult. But we also work with data from Wuhan, uh, yeah. mainly yeah. with the people that travel in and out of Wuhan. Yeah. For those, yeah. uh, it was easier to get. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, an interval where this person, you know, was infected, yeah. and from there when we develop the first symptom. Yes, yeah. But yeah. I haven't seen, you know, when I have seen, you know, in in other methods uh, to compute reproductive number, in general they use, I think they were using a gamma model or something. I, I don't remember exactly which was, but the the basically the the value of the parameters was not validated. It was, yeah. you know. And then what they, what we found is that this has an important effect yes. on many other things that go after that. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. yeah. So we did some work with, with these people in, in the Belvice Hospital oh, yeah. that we, we just collect for the fifth wave. So it was the Delta variant. Uh, we collected information on when these persons were infected and when they had the first symptom. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, and we did, you know, it was, you know, the problem is that when we got that, the, the analysis, it was too late. I mean, we were at a different phase of the pandemic. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but still, I think, yeah, it's it's good to, yeah, have the methods in place. And uh, so I think at the moment still, uh, yeah, the, the work on infectious diseases is very important because, yeah, now we, we have... Yeah, we, we have experienced, yeah, what what's, yeah, kind of data there typically is, uh, what kind of pro problems there can be. Um, and yeah, now having the methods ready for, yeah, maybe a new disease or a new virus, a new, let's hope not a pandemic. Yeah, 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 yeah very yeah, important. Yeah. Um, yeah, and one more question. I mean, when you were getting the data from the hospitals, uh, was the data, clean enough to be able to work because my experience has been with this hospital that although they did their best from the mm -hmm. time that the data uh, you know was given or was collected until we were able to use it I mean it was a pain yeah. yes um, so the so so yeah we were lucky that we were able to work with um the public health institute because they did the collection of the data from all the hospitals yeah and they combined uh, the information from all the hospitals so they did already a very um, yeah huge job in yeah getting the data from the different hospitals in line but indeed wow. we worked also together with yeah several hospitals so on a one-to-one -one basis um because they had yeah some some other questions uh and and the information that was provided to the uh, public health institute it was always summary information yeah so it was not at a patient level um but then yeah indeed yeah if you work indeed with yeah the, the data that comes in from the hospitals yeah I, I agree there are always problems and and uh, there are always yeah some first steps data management steps that you have to take before you can really start doing the analysis uh, the data are not collected for statistical analysis uh, the data are collected for other purposes and uh, that's something that indeed we have to deal with and i'm sorry i'm sorry <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you, Crystal, for this very nice talk. I'm looking forward to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. With some more questions.
it seems that there are no more questions. Uh, well, thanks a lot, Crystal, because it uh, has been a nice, nice talk. Uh, you have presented a lot of work and, and well, it's, it's a nice situation in which uh, all the data was, well, with some problems, but perhaps more efficiently that, that for example, in Spain, that was uh, mm -hmm. a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> have so much regions that have data it's one in 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 a way and yeah yeah, yeah. really difficult to have that makes it very difficult data yeah. yeah and well a lot of work for your for your team and and thank you for summarizing all all this work and these ideas and a lot of papers that that we can consult in your cv and thank you very much for for this uh, presentation thanks a lot for the opportunity and uh, I hope to see many of you very soon. Yeah, me, me too. Really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you very much. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you, Crystal. Nice to see you again.